Welcome to Canada's podcast. Hello, this is Robert Smigel coming to you today with Canada's podcast, where we talk to the entrepreneurs who are making it happen here in British Columbia. Melissa Mills has gone from stocking shelves at Whole Foods to creating products that fly off the shelves. She turned her $500 farmer's market startup into a multi-million dollar plant-based provisions company. Her passion is integrity and real food. She's proof that a business of any size can operate sustainability and make a difference in its community and beyond. Well, Melissa, welcome to Canada's podcast. Thanks for taking the time today to be here for all our listeners. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm pretty excited to chat with you. Good. Okay. So let's get started. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and give us the details on your current business. Are you from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada? Where are you from? Yeah, I'm from Canada, not British Columbia. I'm from a very small town in Ontario called Jackson's Point. Uh, it's the ice fishing capital of Ontario. It's a it kind of a north of Toronto a little bit. And I grew up there with my mom and my sister and my brother uh, in a very small town. Okay, good. Okay, now let's talk about your business. Can you, I've kind of started off a little bit uh, about what it is, but maybe just elaborate a little bit more on what you guys do. Yeah, sure. So I started Spreadem Kitchen, which was a dip company. Uh, it's since evolved in sort of to plant-based cheeses and we make butter now too. Um, but it really started as a dip company in the farmer's market and how that sort of came about is I've always had this, I don't know, I've always worked sort of minimum wage jobs and, you know, I've gone to college several times, but I just never could find the right fit. And I always wanted to do something that was meaningful with my life, not just always following money and that sort of thing. And I was turning 30 and I still hadn't quite found what I felt like I was really good at, which was always something more creative. Um, I never had like a manager's position. Um, I've been fired several times in my life for insubordination and and sort of those types of things. So I didn't quite know what I was going to do. So one day I just decided that I was going to save up a little extra money by selling some dips at the farmer's market which I've always been really interested in making regular food or like convenient style food, but making it at home and making it healthy. Like an example would be like ketchup. I would take, you know, tomato paste and add baits to it to sweeten it and, and sort of like go along those lines. And so people knew me and my, you know, my friend circle as somebody who makes really delicious, healthy foods. So I started selling these at the farmer's market and they just started flying off out of the coolers, I guess. Um, I sold all 500 units in the first two hours of the first farmer's market. And from there, I really thought, hey, I found something that's really awesome, something where I can be myself, I can be creative. Um, And it's got a bit of a hustle to it because I've always been very entrepreneurial. And I just thought that's where it would end, but it it just continued to grow. Good. And you have grown quite a bit. (laughs) I mean, the company is worth... uh, multi-million dollar business now so um but you had to get started somewhere did you need financing to start your company and how do you currently make money in the business now obviously you have products you sell is there one particular product that sells more than others so i didn't need any financing and i think that's where i can be sort of a beacon of hope for a lot of entrepreneurs that you know they feel like they don't have much money maybe they have a thousand dollars maybe they have $5,000. Maybe they don't have, you know, family that can kind of chip in for their idea because maybe they don't believe in their idea. Like when I first started people in within my family circle, not to my face, but behind my back was like dips. Nobody's going to buy dips. You know, like this is a hobby kind of thing, you know, and and we're a $5 million company. So um, it was more about my work ethic, I, I suppose. And I really started with nothing. Like I literally started with $500. I had a bicycle, I had a blender that I got for my birthday, uh, like a Vitamix. And I had um, this $500. So I just used that $500 very sparsely to buy some coolers and to buy, you know, ingredients. But then I just kept putting that little bit of money back into the business. And I was working a side job. So of course, I worked a job during the week. and you know, and then I did this on the weekend. So it's not like I left everything, uh, but I eventually actually got fired from that other job <laughs> anyway, <laughs> which was like easy to then, you know, decide that I was going to take this thing uh, even further. But I mean, 
I think bootstrapping, I took bootstrapping to a whole other level in the sense that I would use my local, I was part of Spud, which is an online delivery, grocery delivery, one of the first ones. Um, and they were buying from me. But when I would drop off my products to them to sell, I would actually take their boxes from all the other products and re and use those boxes as my distributor boxes. It didn't matter if it was lettuce. It didn't matter if it was chip box or something like that. I would just like cross the name out and put right spread them over it. So it was like little things like that, that I did along the way to help build the business before, you know, investing in, you know, having to commit to two pallets of boxes for $5,000 or, um, you know, and I was doing this all out of commissary space. So I didn't have a lot of storage space either. Um, and so I still haven't gotten any, well, I did get some financing to do a build out that I did this year, but I would say for the first three years, I was a million dollar company before I got a loan from, from the bank. Okay. I want you to give me a key piece of knowledge or information about your industry that our listeners can learn from. So something that the common person may not know about the food industry that you're in. I think a lot like something that people, if they want to get into food should know is the difference between markup and margin and how important it is to make sure that you're doing the math and that it's in margin and not markup um, because you could be pricing your product incorrectly, um, which is really important, especially in CPG because, you know, margins are generally pretty narrow along the line and the retailers are the ones that end up getting the most. So in order to make sure that you are in a good position from the beginning, it's important to really know that. And I would say that, you know, you kind of along the lines of pricing your product, like there's a lot of middlemen in CPG, like you know, you've got distributors and retailers, but you've got brokers and you've, you've got a whole bunch of like cut, you know, death by a thousand cuts kind of scenario. So to make sure that, you know, you've got a really strong understanding of your cost of goods. And where you would be able to, um, you know, through economies of scale, eventually build back a little bit in your own margin, but making sure that you have enough cushion from the start, I think is really important. Okay. So like I mentioned before, you, you've grown a lot and you're still operating out of Vancouver, but what is the long-term vision and what will your company look like in the future? Do you see the company expanding into other areas and where beyond Vancouver, BC or even Canada? Yeah, my vision for the company isn't necessarily in terms of growth or how much money we make. It's more uh, based on community, I guess. And so how we measure that is, well, through various sort of like charity things that we do, but and, and within our own employees, like this year was the first year that I could say that every single person was getting paid a living wage here in Vancouver. And that was a pretty big deal because the living wage in Vancouver is pretty high. Um, and so, you know, just kind of like those types of milestones along the way. One of my bigger visions is to be able to build a rooftop garden on the top of our facility that, you know, encompasses sort of solar, but also a place where people can from the company can go upstairs to connect or have their lunches or just have like a, you know, a really beautiful space to eat their lunch in and sort of like surrounding the business with those types of values. And I think when you produce a really good product or and you have really good values for the ingredients you use, like making sure that all of our nuts are sourced ethically is a really big thing for me and making sure that we're going direct to farms and we understand, you know, the whole process and making sure those people are getting treated well and making sure that we're contributing to their community as much as we live in this big global world. Everything is kind of local because it is at the touch of a finger or at the end of your fingertips. Um, so that's kind of how I manage, you know, how Spreadham grows, but we would like to, we're doing a U.S. expansion uh, this year. So we're hoping to grow this to a hundred million dollar company and then hoping to do a lot of good along the way. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about doing business in uh, Vancouver and what that looks like for you. What are the biggest benefits for you and being an entrepreneur here in Vancouver, BC? I want you to give some of the good points about starting a company here. But I also want you to give us some of the tough things or challenges you've had for our listeners so they can keep an eye out for them. 
I would definitely say the best thing about starting a natural food company in Vancouver is the density of people who get what you're doing. So not just like customers being one of them, like a lot of people here have the lifestyle uh, of like, you know, natural food or they care, they know what an adaptogen is or they enjoy the outdoors and understand what a life, like a healthy lifestyle is all about. Um, so it's really, really easy when you have a natural food brand to connect with your customer and get the velocities going. Um, so, and secondly, I think that Vancouver has an amazing um, sort of density of healthy food businesses that are willing to help. There's a great community here, uh, big and small, and I haven't had nothing but um, wonderful experiences with, you know, Ian from Hippie Snacks, which is a huge, which is a really big company compared to my company. And they have really great values. And I can actually email Ian a question and he gets back to me, you know, within two hours sometimes or less, or, you know, just all the mingling and events that they have specific for food businesses in Vancouver, I think is um, pretty unique. Um, some bad things about Vancouver is probably labor and um, the cost of living here can cause a business to sort of stumble or struggle because you have to put out a lot. Like you can't obviously, you can only run your business by yourself for so long. You know, I was blending dips day and night till 3 a.m. Couldn't really think I could afford one person to help me because at the time, all I could afford was $12, which was more than minimum wage at the time. But, you know, it was a lot. And then, so I think the cost of living and the cost of rent so like facility rent and stuff is can can be kind of a stifling. Now, you're from Ontario, but you've been obviously living in Vancouver for a while. If you were to start all over again, and you just moved to Vancouver, BC, but this time you don't know anyone, knowing what you know now, what would you do? And how would you go about starting all over again as an entrepreneur? Oh. Some things you, know, you do I differently think, that you learned along the way. I think I would just be so shy to connect with people as much as I was. Like I lived here for 10 years before making one friend. You know, I was, I was very sort of like intimidated by, you know, Vancouver people, I think. And so understanding how warm and welcoming they really are once you start putting yourself out there more, I think that is definitely one thing that would have helped me along the way a little sooner instead of trying to take on a whole bunch of stuff and learn everything on my own. So networking a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk about your morning routine. What's the first hour look like for you when you get up in the morning? Do you have a specific routine or a ritual that helps you get motivated to start your day? Yeah, I'm definitely a follower of the 5 a.m. club. I don't know if you've ever heard that. But, yeah, sure. Um, so I do that. So I spend the first 20 minutes exercising aggressively. Uh, the second 20 minutes um, writing in a journal or just like writing whatever comes out. Um, and then I spend the next 20 minutes uh, doing a meditation. Okay. Do you think entrepreneurs have to be weird or unique in a positive way or are wired differently? Yeah, 100% I do. I think uh, entrepreneurs have either have an extra a, a pain threshold, I guess, a more, a, you know, a higher threshold for pain than most people. Uh, I think that they are good in a crisis, um, not just from the point of because you handle a crisis in your business, but I, I think that in order to grow in our lives, just as human beings, one common factor is crisis. Crisis always puts you in a position to change something and stick to it through motivation before you have to stick to it through um, sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Anyway. Um, yeah, kind of, you, you know, before you have to stick to it. So I think that entrepreneurs are just kind of wired in a way where they're kind of like, they like thrills. They like adrenaline. They kind of have a high risk tolerance. They're mm -hmm. they've got a hard working. They got a vision, and they they can see it. You know, they can visualize maybe a little bit better before people around them can kind of squash their idea. So yeah, definitely. 
Okay, entrepreneurs like to read. What books are you reading now and why, or even audiobooks, podcasts, and the like? And can you recommend any books for our listeners who are also aspiring entrepreneurs? Yeah, I read a lot. I read a lot, a lot, a lot. So um, I made a little list here because I didn't want to forget my favorite book. So The One Page Marketing Plan by Alan Dibb is a really amazing book. It's really action oriented. It will get you really fired up and thinking about your business. Uh, Ramping Your Brand by James Richardson is something I read recently. Again, it's like one of those books where you almost, it's like a workbook where with every chapter, you're just like, okay, you know, you start writing notes or think getting your, your brain going. Um, the Dorito Effect. For food business people, I think this is really huge. This one inspired me on a personal level too. And it's kind of all about how um, natural flavoring actually tricks your brain into eating more and how we've kind of gotten into this really sick kind of food system um, and then how to kind of get out of it. Um, and then Joe Dispenza, anything by him, uh, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself is a really uh, influential book for me just because of how I kind of grew up and it, getting to where I am today took a lot of mindset shifting and habit uh, shifting. And then my last is Richard Feynman, who is a quantum physicist. He's somebody that I have admired since I was a teenager. Um, and I highly recommend looking up his YouTube um, video that is called um, Imagine, Just Imagine. And he talks about different things in the, the world of physics, um, as simple as being a tree, but it helps you just look at life in a totally different way beyond material things and, and look at the chemistry of like what's happening in the world and it, it's mind-blowing okay good we'll put those in the show notes okay we know that you're not working all the time and we also know that vancouver is a lifestyle city how do you balance work and relax and you how do you relax when you're not working what are your favorite activities to do in british columbia do you ski bike kayak golf hike or something go for a drive yeah, I am very, very sporty. So the whole reason I came out to British Columbia in the beginning was I'd always hoped of being a sort of a snowboard instructor at Whistler Mountain. So I that's how I ended up here and I became a lifty up in Whistler Mountain. And then um, other things I like to do before shredding Mad Pow uh, is I started doing this cold water swim club. So you basically go there at 8 a.m. on Saturday mornings into the Lynn Canyon River, which is beyond freezing cold. And you try to sit in there for as long as you possibly can. And I tell you that already, I've only done it two times. And it's I, all I do is think about wanting to go back and, and do it again. And then oh, when you're in, actually in it, when, when you're in the water, you want to get out, but you actually want to go back. Yeah, it's changing. It, it's like brings over this calmness, but like peacefulness after you get out of there. It's addictive, I would say. Interesting. It's weird. You have to try that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've almost, I think you've almost answered this question. If you weren't doing what you do now, what would you like to do for a profession? Um, I think that I would really like to do something where I'm giving back, and my hope is that I can do something with kids and food related education, um, and sort of mix in creativity and just sort of thinking about things differently. What kind of a job would you not like to do? Uh, cardiac technician. Oh, that's pretty detailed. Okay. In business, what is your favorite word, quote, or sentence that you like to use? Do you have anything that you use frequently? Yes, I have three. Can I share all three? Feel free. Okay. Number one is where there's a will, there's a way. This has been my mantra since I think I was six years old. Um, another one is um, the obstacle is the way. So whenever I'm feeling like I don't want to go there, I force myself to, and it always works out. And the last one is it isn't happening to you. It's happening for you. Oh, very nice. I like those. Very motivational, inspiring. Okay. Uh, what's your least favorite word or sentence you do not like to hear? Is there something that comes up once in a while someone says that oh, I, I can't or won't or don't or yeah I think it's can't it's like whenever somebody is sort of using language that makes them come across as a victim or when they're using language that puts me in a position of 
assuming that I can't achieve something, um, I get I get pretty passionate and riled up about that. Yeah, those things. Okay. Negativity. Stay away. Yes. <laughs> if you had to pick one or two words to describe yourself, what would it be and why? I would say passionate and there's so many great words out there. Passionate and hardworking. Okay. Anything keeping you up at night these days? Is, do you, when you go to bed at night, are you thinking about work still or are you in a different space? Thinking about other things, kind of letting your mind rest? Anything keeping yes, you up? I, I never, there was for a long time, nothing kept me up at night. And whenever someone would ask a question, I'm like, I don't know what that what it, that is like. But yeah, I mean, as you grow your business, right? And little things come up here and there. It's, it's generally like tiny operational things or, you know, can I get an office assistant to help me? Uh, and nobody's applying. And it's just like, oh no, like, is, am I going to be doing this forever? But I think I'm pretty good at like, through the tools and the teachers that I follow through reading books and other things and learning how to quiet my mind is something that I actively pursue. So I'm pretty good at kind of like shutting that down. Okay. I want you to give us the top three things on your inspired life list. This could be what you want to do. TEDx talk, travel more, start another business, write a book, anything like that. Yeah. I mean, there's just so many amazing experiences in life. So I guess, one thing I would like to do is write a memoir. I have come from a place of, you know, where a lot of people don't get the opportunities that I get. And so I think it would be really cool to share those in some kind of a memoir slash cookbook combo. Um, another thing I would really like to do is start some kind of, I don't know if it's like a something in a for kids, really. I really want to do something that, take children and help them learn about the importance of food and get them cooking. I think learning how to cook at a really young age was a really great way to not only be creative, but also give me confidence that I could take care of myself. Um, and I would really love to kind of have a place in Costa Rica that was sort of a little wellness getaway for myself. Yeah. There's a lot of yoga retreats here and spas and places like that. Yeah. Sure, that would be nice to have you come down here. Okay, do you have any advice that you may have received that you can pass on to entrepreneurs out Canada? Has anyone ever said anything to you that kind of resonated with you at a time when you really needed it? Yeah, definitely. I think the latest one was this morning, actually. And it's Embrace the Suck the David Goggins kind of thing, but it was actually said to me by um, a colleague, embrace the suck where it's like, when you get comfortable and everything's going really well, it doesn't necessarily mean that anything, you know, like things are going well, you should push yourself further and like, and, and feel the pain because that's how you, you know, feel better later. So I would say, yeah, embrace the suck. <laughs> that's a good one. Okay. We're going to wrap things up here, Melissa. How can our listeners get hold of you? And is there anything you'd like to add before you leave us today? Um, so they can get a hold of me. I have an email. So it's Melissa Mills at Gmail. Oh, no. It's Melissa at spreadomkitchen.com. Um, I'm not on Instagram or, or Twitter personally, but you can follow our um, business one. And I'm often the person to reply or, or get messages through that. Um, and then I guess a few things I'd like to share are that, first of all, I think Food is so important just for mindset and, and like where you're going with your business. And I think sometimes as entrepreneurs, we don't make time for ourselves because we're always putting everything we have into our business. And I think I did go through a phase of doing that for a year or two um, before getting back to kind of my roots and how I started in, in valuing good food. And I think it's really important that, you know, you make the time and create a priority for only putting real food in your body because that's what's going to optimize your brain and your mental function and food it has such a strong connection to your emotions and and your longevity and just everything i would say that you know just making the time to put good food in your body as fuel is probably 
the most important thing that a lot of people don't do and they should do. Yeah, I had Shell Cran on the show one time and she said that uh, entrepreneurs are like athletes. We need to take care of our bodies because yeah, there's not a lot of downtime. Agree. There's not a lot of down, downtime and we've got to be there to keep the ship going. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Great. Okay, Melissa, thanks for coming on the show. I've learned a lot about you and I'm sure our listeners have as well. Yeah, thanks so much. It was a great chat. Great. Okay, we'll see you next time.